We're looking at life tests. Uh, in many ways, they're leadership tests that people have to go through or in terms of this. And when you're looking at these things, I'm doing them in, a, in an order that's chronological in order, but the best way to think about all these things that I've been talking about, and I'll continue to talk about a few more tonight, is if you are standing in the center of a room and you look around and there are tapestries on the wall, like if you're looking that way, you see the awakening tapestry. And if you turn around in this one, you see come Holy Spirit. When you turn around, you see Jesus is Lord. These are not chronological in terms of when they happen to us. They are more... This is a panoramic view of tests that I believe that God gives to us. And we've been looking at uh, these tests in terms of, some of it in terms of Samuel as we have been studying that. Anyway, I want to start tonight with this and kind of walk through these, this group that we have here. The time test, it really has to do with, it takes a while for you to get your act together in terms of what God wants you to do with your life or in a certain area of your life. And you have to learn the ropes. And that's where people have to, you see that a lot with youth. I mean, they have to grow into things in terms of what they do. It's kind of like when I became a minister. It took time to learn the ropes. You had to learn how things work. And so I would study in terms of that. Some of it was book learning, some of it's the lab work that we do, but we have time tests. And if God calls you to something, there's probably going to be a preparation time, a schooling time that has to do with that. The word test was the second one we look at. There comes a time in our lives when you have to test God's word or God's word gets tested in terms of what he says, because the world will tell you a lot of different things that really aren't related at all to what the Bible says in terms of that. And so the word test has to do with testing God's word because we live in a corrupted world and the trials that we go through, the situations, the circumstances that we have are things that will test us in terms of what God says in terms of how we're supposed to deal with the issues of our lives, in terms of that. And the word test takes place. You get out there and get involved with people, and it will test you, and it will test God's word as it comes to you. You know, it's kind of like, well, Jesus said, you've heard it said, us and thus, but I say to you, that's a word test right there. The third one has to do is, is the character test. We looked at Samuel and Eli and a contrast between their lives in terms of how things were doing. Eli was a corrupt religionist and uh, priest of the time, and he was lazy and everything, and he had two boys that went sour on him, but Samuel was raised in that context, of that environment. And so he saw as... Well, his models were really corruption. And yet, because of who he was, in terms of who he was, that his character would develop over a period of time. And God says, be this, but life situations sometimes say something else. And we looked at that. The fourth one we looked at was the motivation test. And uh, 1 Samuel, I want to read this one to you, because 1 Samuel chapter 8, was where that one came from. Uh, and this was after Samuel was an older man. And uh, it's uh, when, he, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel. The name of his second son, uh, Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. And the motivation test, for him here, we all of us want to see our children turn out okay. We want to see them uh, taken care of. And he, that's what Samuel was doing. But his internal motivations were not really along the same line as God's agenda for a, your life. And he has to choose. And even though he is God's man and he hear, listens to God's word and he was 
giving direction to the entire country. He's still a man. And out of that man, he has his own agendas that come along. And sometimes those agendas don't sit well with where God is. And so he had a motivation to this. Why did you put your boys up there? What's the real reason? And in terms of our lives, there are things that happen to us where we need to examine, why did I do this? Or why am I acting this way? What's really motivating me here? Uh, one of the things is that I can always ask, who's getting the glory here? Is it God or is it me? It's something that I have to do every so often just to kind of check my, uh, where I am in terms of my life. And that's the motivation behind it. And the truth is we're all human. Just like Samuel was human. And he got off of God's agenda and he got off onto his agenda. And when he did that, things happened that weren't supposed to happen. Anyway, that's what we looked at in terms of motivation tests. The uh, fifth one we looked at was the servant test. And the servant test really has to do with the, when Samuel was growing up, he did all the things that he was supposed to do. And this is where you get out there. Are you willing to clean toilets? Are you willing to uh, take care of people? Are you willing to work with small children? Are you willing to do this or that? Are you willing to go to prison? Are, you know, it has to do with are you go willing to be a servant where God asks you to be? Or do you want to be in the limelight? And always up in front of people. A servant role is a, is a test. And sometimes we get thrown into that. And that is also sometimes where we are when we are young in the faith is the servant role that Samuel did. And he was just taking care of business around the church, you might say. And that's what he was doing. He was probably learning about God in the context of that. And it, that was part of his time test. But he was a servant of the church and of God. And the sixth one we looked at was the wilderness test. And we actually looked at Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 12, where Jesus was driven into the wilderness. And there's a model there, I think, for a lot of us. You know, he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in water, and the Spirit came down and descended upon him. And as soon as that took place, he was about to begin his earthly ministry here. And the, and the Spirit, it says in Mark, drove him into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he had to deal with the temptations that Satan threw against him. And I think there's a certainly times in our lives when we have to deal with things, and we're in wilderness times, dry times in our lives, desolate places, you might say. Things are not well. Things are dried up. Things are not being produced in terms of our lives. And we're driven into these places of desolation and spiritually dry times. And the reason is sometimes this is a test. Why are tests given? To find out where we're at in terms of our life and how that works. It might have to do with God preparing you. When Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, the purpose was to make sure that he had all his ducks in a row and that he was doing the right thing in terms of his life, right motivation. It was test, testing his character. You know, one of the things that, you know, Satan said, he said, why don't you turn these rocks into bread? I mean, there's nobody out here. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to see you. And that's when Jesus dealt with that temptation, which is, you know, a man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. And he says, there's a time. When I shall eat. There's a time when I'll be taken care of. But I am not going to sacrifice the future for indulgence at this point in time. And we do that a lot. That's by the way, that's one of the that's the temptation number one. Is that we sacrifice the future because we want to indulge ourselves at this point. And Jesus said, I'm not doing it. And that was a part of that wilderness test that he went into. Now, that's where we were last week. And you can pick up the CD because I went into it a little bit more extensive than that. Tonight, we're going to start with the misunderstanding test. And I want to talk to you about being misunderstood. As a leader, 
Now, everybody here has been in a leadership role at various times in your lives, and you may be right now in various situations, circumstances, or life situations. Misunderstood. Leaders will be misunderstood in terms of their actions, their words, their attitudes, their motives. And the reason that they are misunderstood is that whoever is judging them, and by the way, it's probably a judgment or an opinion, because we all have them, don't we? Opinion? I mean, I know you sit around your campfire and talk about me. Everybody's got an opinion. But they're not walking in your shoes. Now, this is a test because it causes us to examine our own attitudes about things as well because it tests us when we are misunderstood. There's a couple reasons why you get misunderstood and why you also probably are misunderstanding those who are leaders in your life or maybe in front. First off, you're not walking in their shoes, but you know you could do the job better. The second thing is, your lens is the way you judge the world. The way you see the world is the, not the way the world is. The way you see the world is the way you are. And that is a great truth. And once you learn that great truth, then you can do some self-examination. The way you see the world is not the way the world is. It's the way you are. And one of the things that why some people get misunderstood in leadership roles is because the people who are judging them or forming an opinion about what they're doing is they're viewing them from their lens. And so the way they see their le that leadership role is not from wh what it should be or what it is, but from the way they are. Now, misunderstanding tips. Anybody here a parent? All you parents, raise your hand. Okay. Parenting is a leadership role. Have your kids ever misunderstood your motives? I mean, really. It's the easiest one that I know of, is the parent. Pa kids, you know, they, you'll do something or you'll make some kind of call and Boy, they do not understand you at all, and they get mad, and they do all kinds of things, and, you know, and they'll huff and puff and do all the stuff that they are. Uh, I learned a long time ago from my father, and uh, this becomes the uh, really kind of the motivation of ministry that I have, as well as raising my own kids, which is, he said, Jack, my job is not to get you to love me. My job is to get you to love God and please Him. So it doesn't matter whether you love me or not. Because as a parent, he was telling me that his stewardship of his life was probably raising us boys, and there were two of us. Now Samuel, we've been looking at the life of Samuel, but we're looking at the early life of Samuel. Samuel was a guy who was misunderstood by those that are around here. But the primary example, I would say, for misunderstanding is Moses. If you read the story of Moses, we did the study in the Exodus and wilderness. Moses was misunderstood all the time. Those people were always grumbling about his leadership. They were murmuring, and murmur, murmur is very, very uncreative because it says itself twice. But they would murmur about him, and several times he, he and Aaron were confronted by people, and the, the people of, that Korah had and all that, and because they didn't like his leadership. They misunderstood the fact that he was leading them in God's ways, and they didn't want to go that way. He was misunderstood. People will misunderstand you if you are in a position of leadership. I don't care what kind of leadership that is. You will be misunderstood. And as parents, 
You've got to decide about your kid. Who are you doing it for? Who are you parenting for? Are you doing it so you can get your kids to love you? I, I see grandparents do this all the time. They spoil their grandkids because what they want to do is they want their grandkids to really like them or love them. Well, you know what? A grandparent is not much different than a parent, and if you're in charge of them, I, do you want them to act right? Or you want them to be spoiled rotten? You know, that's part of it too. Parents, you know, God has given you a gift of children that you are steward of as long as they are in your household. How do you want them to turn out? As pastor, God gives me people who come to this church and one of the things that I am very, very much involved in is I am trying to grow people here spiritually, not to please me or to love me because, oh, that's a mixed bag anyway, but to, to please God with their lives and to learn how to live as God's people. One of the things I said, don't tell me what your church believes. Tell me what you believe because I know this. When it comes to your life situation and circumstance, your details of life, your directions of life, your crises, you better know what you believe. And so I'm always trying to develop people in terms of their life that way so that they know how to live their lives. So you know better sometimes when you need to know better. Another problem with misunderstandings, though, is, you know, you, you get them is, You've got to stay free from anger. When you are misunderstood a lot, and if you, if you read the story of Moses, the one thing that he did that really kept him out of the promised land, although I have my own speculation, is that God was giving the boy a break. Personally, he said, you've done enough. You don't have to do it anymore. But he struck that rock in that, when they were looking for water, and he was mad when he did it. And when he did that, out of anger, it put some kind of a problem into him in terms of that. If you get angry because you're a leader, hey, parent, you know, if you're a leader in business, if you're in your, in your workplace, anger, bitterness, and resentment, you better take it to God. And get, let him help you deal with it. Because if you don't do that, sooner or later it's going to boil over and then it starts making dead spots around you with other people. I had a, when I was down in Kentucky, I was at a church for 23 years down there and over a period of time I'm dealing with people for a lot of years and some people are just plain not very nice. And some of the people in that church really got under my skin to the point where I was at the point where I was this about 13 years into it. I said, Lord, if you don't fix me, I am not going to be able to minister to these people anymore because I want to kill them. And I, had, I told him, I said, I don't know how to fix myself. I don't know how. But I said, I'm going to submit myself to you, and you need to work this out in me. And I took two weeks at that time, and I went off by myself, and I cannot tell you how God did it, but he did it. He fixed me, but I was dealing with anger and bitterness and resentment for a lot of these people. Not a lot, probably 20 out of a church of 450. But it was just enough to tear me up on the inside and get me to the place where I said, man, I'm going to have to get out of this. I cannot do this. And it was because they were not appreciative, you might say, of the leadership. They misunderstood a lot that was going on. And I know this, that if you have ever been in a leadership role, people can be wear you out. You know, you got to remember, people are no good. That's why Jesus died. That's a great truth. That, by the way, includes you and me. 
were no good. That's why Jesus died. And when it comes to dealing with people and life situations and circumstances where you seem to be, you think that you're being misunderstood, it is best to take your anger, resentment, and bitterness to God and let Him deal with it. Now, we know that there are a lot of other kinds of things that come our way in terms of uh, misunderstanding. But they, these are comes from other people most of the time, don't they? You'll be... You want to move on? Oh, be patient. Be patient. I want to talk about the patience test. Um, we live in a world that wants immediate gratification, gratification, don't we? We live in a world where everything needs to be microwave rather than crockpot cooking. And it's worse now than it was 20 years ago, and I know that. But, I mean, patience, you know what? In, in the King James Version, it is said patience is what? Long suffering. You know as well as I do, if you are impatient with somebody, you are suffering on the inside. Are you not? That's what happens when you are impatient and they are just not being what they need to be for you. And the key there is for you. Impatient. Patience test is very... Uh, tough to handle. Never pray for patience. This is spiritual direction. Because if you pray for patience, guess what? God will give you the test. I guarantee it. But patience basically means to suffer. That's what it means. And long suffering means that it happens for a long time. Now, I don't know what's long for you. It could be ten minutes. But for something long suffering, it means to suffer. And what's it for? Well, it's there to help us in terms of enduring things. But I'm I about twenty years ago. I go to the hospital a lot, and I pray for people in the hospital. And about twenty years ago, I had an aha moment, and that moment told me it said, you know. I've been around people who have been sick or have had surgery or things for a lot of years. And one of the things that I have noticed about people who have these things is they are impatient with themselves to get well. So about 20 years ago, I started praying for patience when I went to see people who were in the hospital. Because not only do they need to heal, but they need to be patient with themselves. In fact, that's what we call people who are in the hospital, don't we? Patience. They need to be patient. And it's mainly being patient with themselves in terms of this. Now, the purpose of patience, and this is a test. For a lot of us, this is a test, and it's one that we have to learn more than once, usually. Patience is a test. And what is it for? I believe it's for us to develop self-control. You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. It's right there at the end. You know, if you can't control yourself, you can't lead very well. So patience is a test to help us develop self-control and when you take this test self-control is the issue because if you can't control yourself you can't lead very well and where is self-control it takes place in two places in your actions and your tongue Oh my God, people, our tongues are such vicious little animals. And if you are if you're suffering if you're suffering, your tongue likes to wag. 
And the other thing is, in our actions, if, if we are impatient with somebody, we'll take action against them, will we not? And those two things are where self-control has to be manifest. And that's part of the test of being patient. It has to do with endurance in times of trouble. It has to do with submitting also to God's agenda. By the way, patience also has to do with submitting to other people's agendas. Not just God's agenda, but other people's agendas. Uh, if you submit to God, I'm, I'm going to assume that everybody here, this may be a bad assumption, but I, I'm going to make it anyway. If you want to live your life as one of God's people, that you want to be his man or woman in this world, and you want to reflect to the world around you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, one of the things that you're going to get is a patience test. This is where, this has to do with agenda and schedule. Because that's where patience really comes into play. When somebody is on our, not on your agenda or on your schedule, you get to suffering. Sometimes it seems like long suffering. If you submit to God with your life, I am here to tell you this truth. God is not on your agenda. And he's probably not on your schedule either. And so what he says to you in terms of how you live your life and the situations and circumstances of your life more than likely won't fit your timetables, your schedules, your agenda. One of the reasons why I've, I've done this for, ever since I start, went into the ministry, I always have an open door policy. If you come to the church and, you, and I'm there, you can walk into my office. And you can interrupt me at any time you want. Uh, very rarely do I sequester myself to such a point that I won't take somebody walking in. Because I've always had an open door policy when it comes to ministry. Because if you read the Gospels, Jesus was interrupted so much. And that's where he did his ministry. And a lot of this has to do with just a haphazard thing, the open-door policy, where you just walk in, hey, Jack, what are you doing? I have people come in there, and even some of them even now call them drive-by ministry, drive-by counseling. And they'll come in for five minutes, and, and they'll do this stuff. And I've learned this. But in other words, for me to do this, I have to make sure that i got to be careful that I don't get so hung up on what I'm doing that I blow somebody off because I know that a lot of what I do in terms of brush fire counseling happens in one to five minutes. And the, the truth is, if you're God's man or woman in this world, there are people around you, and your ministry may actually be very haphazard in terms of some of that, and it may happen in one to five minutes with people. And it's good to keep that in mind. But that also means that you've got to be off, able to get off your agenda real quick and so you can get on to really what God's agenda is in terms of this. Now, <coughs> the, the test actually gets us off our agenda. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I don't know where I am in terms of the outline. Let me see if I can find it here. No, we're not going there yet. Uh, Samuel, when he was growing up, he was, not <coughs> he was not raised up as the prophet and judge of Israel right away. It took time for this to happen with him. You know, if you'd look at timing, first off, he's a young guy. He doesn't know the ropes yet in terms of that. God hadn't talked to him, and once he did start talking to him, then he had to bring him along. Do you, does anybody here believe that maybe you need to learn something along the way 
in terms of either head knowledge or what I call lab experience, where God works you in terms of developing you in terms of that. This has to do with patience. And Samuel was not raised up immediately. There were things that had to happen in terms of his life. First off, he had to become a man. And I know that, you know, when you're 15, 16 years old, people, God, I'm, I, want to, I want to be a man now, you know. But we aren't in, in terms of that. We want to grow up right away. We, we can't wait till we drive a car. We can't wait, you know, and all of these kinds of things. And, but there were people that had to die for him to become the prophet and judge of Israel. Eli had to die. His boys had to die. You know, they have the positional leadership that he was going to move into. But it wasn't going to be on his time schedule. It was going to be on God's time schedule. And so that's the way patience works with all of us. Sometimes you've got to understand, it's not according to your schedule. Samuel's just one example. You've got them all over the Bible. Noah, God, you know, God says, build an ark. Took him a hundred years to build the ark. About fifty years into it, I'm going, Boy, I don't know if I'm just wasting my time or what. That's one of those things where he's yeah, gonna have to be long suffering in this. Because it's not on my schedule. Sometimes we're in a in a job position. You know, I could run this this company better than that guy. Or that gal. I know I could do better than them. And yet, you're not there. And the first, that's where it gets in. Noah probably said, when is it going to rain, God? I mean, really. I have to put up with this. What's all this in terms of a message? Well, we all have to be patient in terms of things that happen in our life. And then you have to be patient with people as well in terms of how they are, um, in terms of that. That's a test. Closely related <laughs> to patience is the frustration test. The frustration test. Now, for this one, I'm going to read from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Verses 1 to 6. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, and yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. They Actually, they did the same thing that Eli's boys did. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. <laughs> God, I love it. Verse 1, when Samuel became old. And then he gets confirmation from the elders. Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to govern us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Okay? Frustration test. <laughs> this is a little bit farther into it than just patience. You know, patience is long-suffering. Frustration test. This is when things can't be achieved the way you want it. And if you're taking notes, that's, you better write that. This is when things can't be achieved the way you want it. Or, life does not turn out like you wanted it to. Frustration. And it has to do with people, and it has to do with goals in life, it has to do with ambitions, it has to do with relationships. Frustration is not the same as patience because in patience, you can think about it. Oh, I'm long-suffering and I'm, this can't go on forever. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel kind of thing. In the frustration test, this is when things can't be achieved the way you want it and life doesn't turn out 
like you wanted. This is when you have to re-examine the agenda. Maybe you have to re-examine your agenda. This is one of those times when you may have to say, you know, who's really in charge of my life here? Am I going to let God be in charge of my life, or am I going to be in charge of my life? What's really going on here? And the frustration is what is the uh, burr in the saddle, you might say, that keeps us. And this is, uh, when I run into people, those of you who may be 35 to 50, okay, there's a time in our life what we call midlife. Uh, 35 means you'll live to 70, 50 means you'll live to be 100. Some place in the middle of there is where most of us die between the ages of 70 and 100. That's what we call midlife. And midlife crisis is real. Don't let anybody tell you it isn't. And if you're living in it, the best advice I can tell you is this. Lay down until the feeling goes away. <laughs> Not mad at you, because this is where frustration is. It goes all haywire inside of us. Midlife crisis. Midlife, 70 to 100 is the life span, and so 35 to 50 would be midlife. Now, in that time, it's a midlife crisis because, and the, this is definition here, the definition of crisis is nobody's in charge. And nobody knows what's going on. If you come up and we have a world crisis, let's say in the financial markets in this world, it means that nobody's really in charge at that point, and nobody really knows what's going on. And a midlife crisis is a time in life when people experience those two things. Nobody's really in charge. Oh, I don't... And, and they don't really know what's going on. It's a frustrating period of time. Now, it usually happens the first time when you're in high school. Because it, adolescence is the first crisis, because there's two questions that we all ask. Who am I? What am I about? What's my purpose? Those two questions are kind of what drives high schoolers and between 35 and 50, those two questions rise up in us again. And it, very, it will sometimes precipitate a very, very deadly crisis in people's life where nobody's in charge and nobody knows what's going on. It's where frustration just kind of goes over the top. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, an example of this. In Samuel's life, in chapter 15, verse 34, to uh, uh, chapter 16, verse 2. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, this is, a, this is a crisis period of time in Samuel's life. Frustration level is in here. We read the part where his boys didn't do right, and so they said, give us a king. Well, they went out, and Saul was the one who was anointed by Samuel to become king. Samuel, uh, Saul did okay for a little while, but then he got into a lot of trouble because he was, dry, he was no longer doing it the way Samuel had given him direction to because he was a spiritual director, and he was no longer doing it God's way, and God was fed up with him. Now, that's the short version of that. 
And things were not working out very well in Israel at the time. Samuel was Saul's mentor, spiritual director, minister, guide, counselor, guru, whatever you want to call him. And he, would, he put a lot of himself into that relationship with Saul over the years. You ever put, have you ever put yourself into something? A lot into something? Well, that's what Samuel had done with Saul. And he went sour. Have you ever had something in your life that you put a lot into it and it just went sour on you? That's frustration level. Well, God says to Samuel, this thing goes bad on him, and they separated and Samuel went his way, and Saul went his way. Now, you've got to remember, Saul is king. That means he's the government. And he was no longer listening to God or God's uh, leader in Samuel. And so they separated company, and then God starts talking to Samuel. Now, he's put a lot into this, so he's got a lot of ownership when it comes to, to Saul. And when you got ownership in something, it drives you crazy if it doesn't work right and it's going sour on you. And God says, my priorities have changed, Samuel. So you need to change your priorities as well. This country is not going to be redeemed by Saul. And it grieves Samuel. It says so in the book. And grief is, is you suffer from this, the frustration level that he was not able to, to lead Saul in such a way that the country would be uh, led well and it would be under God's guidance in terms of things. And, he, and he's just destroyed on the inside and it's frustration level. And he says, God says, how long are you going to grieve, Samuel? Over this? Now let me tell you something about this. I see a lot of people in jobs or with their children or with uh, all kinds of things where you move, you know that God gave it to you. Okay? You know that God has graced you with your life in certain areas. And you move from stewardship to ownership. And that's what Samuel had done. And it's very natural for him to have done that. He became, he took ownership in terms of Saul and the direction the company, country was going under Saul's government. And it was driving him crazy. And then suddenly God says, I'm sorry, we're changing our way. Our priorities are switching. And you have to let go of ownership. Oh my God. One of the hardest things to do if you have moved from stewardship to ownership in terms of something and letting go of it. Because God says so. And he says, Samuel, how long are you going to grieve here? Things are changing. We're moving on now. So get your act together. Now this could happen in divorce. You know, where you do that, or it could happen in a job loss. It could happen in a death in the family or a spouse or something. It can be mothers. I say mothers mainly. When kids grow up and they leave, I don't see a lot of men that have empty nest syndrome, but ladies, you know what I'm talking about if you've been through it. And it's a place where how long are you going to grieve over this seeing that things are changing. And that's what was happening to Samuel here. He had put all his life into this, and suddenly God says, we're changing here now. And the frustration turns into something else. Discouragement. Or despair. This is where you say, 
What's the point? And it comes from a deep hole inside of you. You know, if you read this, I mean, we read this Samuel thing here. The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. You know, the place where we go is we go into despair or discouragement. And Samuel is now so discouraged because not only did it not work out with Saul, but he is a, an enemy of the state, you might say. And he says, you know, he says, hey, if I go and anoint this kid, a kid of Jesse's, if Saul gets wind of it, he gets on me, he's going to kill me. And Samuel's crying in his beer, you know, basically he says, you know, I did all this work. And Saul's playing king, and he's doing it terrible. And God told me to do that in the first place. And now God's changed his mind. And here I am. Woe is me. I'll just go out in the garden and eat worms. What's the point? Anybody been in despair? discouragement, where you lose confidence, You're, you have to sort of, it's like pushing a reset button on you and you got to go back to the beginning, everything go, starts over again. Well, one of the things about this is, when it comes to discouragement or despair, um, what he does for him is he gives him a job. Uh, here, and he says, I want you to fill your horn with oil and go, and I'll send you to Jesse. You know what a prophet's job is? To anoint. Um, and in the story of Elijah, which is 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, um, if you know the story, I mean, I, I've, I worked it over one time, and, and uh, but this was after all the... Uh, war took place between Elijah and Jezebel and Ahab. And the Lord says, said to him, and he's up in the cave. And I'll tell you, everybody, anybody ever go in your cave? Buddy, and God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And when God asks you a question, he's not looking for information. And he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Basically, he's raising up to him where he is and who he is and all that. But then he gives him a job. In chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, and the Lord said to him, Go, return your, on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Assyria, and Yehu the son of Nimshi you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. In other words, he gives him a job to do in his discouragement. What does God tell Samuel to do in his discouragement? He gives him a job. He says, you're going to go do your job, which is you need to anoint people to be king. But what happens when you get into this despair place or discouragement place? You have to fall back into God's provisions and promises. Or, you go to hell in a basket. It's that simple. You're going to do one or the other, sooner or later. When you get into discouragement and despair, you're either going to fall back into God's promises and provisions that you might have been living in at that point before this happened, and you're going to live there in his provision, and you're going to rest in his promises, or you go to hell in a basket. And, buddy, I see people do it all the time. You know, something happens, discouragement, despair happens in their life, and you know what they do? They go to hell in a basket, rather than falling back and allowing God to give them provision, 
that's sustenance, and then resting in the promises that God has said to you over the years, well, you go to hell in a basket. Same thing happened to Elijah that happened to Samuel. I mean, Elijah was God's man, man. He starts whining up there in that cave, and he is, he is suffering from despair, and his is battle fatigue. And he says, God, I'm the only one left out here. And he says, no, you're not. There's 6,000 of them out there someplace. But you've got a job to do. And by the way, when he tells Samuel to go anoint him, he doesn't say, I know you're afraid. He doesn't say that. He says, go do it. It's a testing time when God takes care of you. What do you do with a discouraged person? A couple of things that I've learned from Scripture. If you can do it to yourself, it's a great thing. First off, you give them a job. Get up and go do something. I don't know how many times I've run into people who are suffering from discouragement. It's the woe is me. You know that, don't you? Woe is me. I'm going to go out in the garden and eat worms. Woe is me. And the best thing to do is get your mind off yourself and go out there and do something positive for somebody else. Get up and go do something. But that's one of the things. But sometimes you can actually give them something to do if they're willing. The other thing is to give them a little bit of encouragement that goes with it. Get them up. Give them something to do. Help them move on. Help them move on. See, but in these, both these situations, especially Samuel, he needs to move on because God's doing a new thing out there, and he needs to be part of that in terms of his. So he says to Samuel, he says, What's your purpose, Samuel? You're a prophet of mine. What is your, what is your job? You are to go anoint the king. In other words, that's what you do. By the way, that's what I do. I anoint kings. Every time someone is elected as elder or deacon in this church, we have an anointing laying on a hand service. And my job is to call forth the Holy Spirit to anoint. I was given this job. That's what I do. That's what Samuel's purpose is. He is supposed to get the leadership moving out there in terms of the government. And so the government went sour, and he said, I don't like these, these guys anymore, God says. And he says, well, go get some new ones. Because they're not doing it God's way. And I've had to do that occasionally, too. It's not necessarily a happy place to be in terms of church at that point in time because I become a target. But that's what he's supposed to do. It's your job. Anoint somebody. Verses 2 and 3. Verses 2 and 3 here in 16, it says, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. <laughs> and the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you should do, and you shall anoint for him whom I name to you. In other words, he says, okay, here's what you want to do. This is, this is where we move from a discouragement test to the warfare test. How many of you people know that as God's people, if you name Jesus as your Savior and Lord, if you are a light in terms of your environment, your community, wherever that is, job, family, wherever, how many of you know that if you do this and you are God's man or woman out there, you're going to run into persecution? How many know that? You believe it? Well, just let your light come on and start talking about it and see what happens. Warfare test is what is going on here at this point in time. In verses 2 and 3, I mean, Samuel said, what? You want me to do what? You want me to serve you when the opposition is out there, the government is out to kill me? 
when I have to deal with per persecution, Saul will kill me. That's what he says. Now, if you, if you read it, God does not even address Samuel's fear. He doesn't say anything. That's okay, I'll be with you. He doesn't say anything. He says, here's what I want you to do. Go do it. You're going to experience, at times, violent opposition to extending the kingdom of God on this earth. If I do this for the Lord, I might lose my job, my spouse, my money, my kids. Have you ever felt like that kind of potential might be there? Some kind of loss that takes place? If you're going to serve the Lord with your life, and you know that it's somewhat of a possibility of a death situation, you're in the warfare test. I don't know. I mean, I've had enough people to know this. If I go to my family, or if I go to my spouse with this Christian stuff, I am going to meet opposition at the best. Yeah. God says, yeah, you're going to. He shows him the reality of the situation. God says, I am done with Saul. I am done with this government. And your job is to go anoint the new government. He tells him exactly what to do in this situation. Now, it's also interesting to notice what he didn't tell him to do. He didn't tell Samuel to tell Saul that he was going to do this. He didn't tell Samuel to go confront Saul. You don't have to set up the kingdom, Samuel. Your job is to pick the king and anoint him. This is not your battle to win that way. So, when it comes to warfare tests, and we get into them, only do what you're told to do. That's the first thing. And second thing is, keep a low profile. There are old warriors, and there are bold warriors, but there are very few old and bold warriors. They have a tendency to get killed. Low profile. Samuel doesn't have any troops. He can't do that. He has no physical strength in this battle. Samuel, you do not have to be the tip of the spear here. All you have to do is anoint the king. Keep a low profile. And the third thing that it does, it gets him out of discouragement. <laughs> it might get him into a fear test. Uh, who knows? But... He gets him out of discouragement. Now, we're going to stop here. And uh, we're going to stop with this. This is, this is one we're not going to talk about tonight. Self-will test. Because none of us have that, do we? Self-will. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to stop until August. Those of you who are uh, not members of this church and do not get the newsletter or are not connected to us, if you want to write your name and your address onto the pad in your in your set, then I will put you on the newsletter list so you'll get notification. But you can bet that we'll be back here either the third or fourth Wednesday in August. And at that point, we're going to finish up these tests uh, that we're looking at here because there's about 12 of them, and they're all places where we get tested in terms of our lives, and that'll be our kickoff for the fall. And then we're probably going to move into kings and kingdom. And, of course, everybody here is a king. You know, there are queens. You have a kingdom. I mean, it can be very small, but it can be very large, too. It has to do with all that is around you. 
You have to deal with other kingdoms too, like your bank, <laughs> just for one, the government for two, other kingdoms. And so we're going to talk about kings and kingdoms. Okay? Let's pray.